Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an NPC Women's Physique Division athlete. Today's guest is Jess Falborn. Jess, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Quinn. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Jess, um, I'm excited to chop it up with you. Uh, we don't usually have a whole lot of females on the podcast, so um, it's it's going to be fun to kind of get into your backstory and just learn how you got into bodybuilding, learn a little bit about your story. So um, I kind of like to ask all of my guests the same two questions, just to kind of get the conversational ball rolling, so to speak. So the first question I have for you is who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? Um, I grew up with, my uncle was really into bodybuilding and he had posters of Ronnie Coleman on the wall. Um, and so it was just always like, shut up and squat, shut up and squat. So Ronnie from day one, um, uh, I love the intensity of, of Branch Warren and his lifting. Like if I had um, a bucket list of who I wanted to lift with, it would be Branch Warren. That would be so cool. Um, I watch a lot of the um, uh, bro chat guys. So all the guys on that Fuad, like I love what he's done from like a business perspective in bodybuilding and kind of bringing awareness to a lot of different things within bodybuilding. Um, and then my, I'd say the, the person I've kind of looked up the most, uh, up to the most has been Sean Clarita. Um, I've been a fan of his for a really, really long time. And then when I relocated up to New Jersey, ended up working out at and working at Signature Fitness where he trains and I've gotten to be really good friends with him. So that's been really cool because he's been someone I've looked up to as like an underdog growing and doing really, really great things in the sport. Um, so just to, just to name a few people that I've kind of looked up to in the sport. Now, uh, what, what about like on the, on the female side? I mean, uh, obviously once you started getting into to bodybuilding, you started competing, I'm sure there were some females that you really aspired to look like, or you really looked up to just like on the male side of things. So in regards to females, who are some of those names that you uh, respect or look up to? That's a great point because I think um, growing up, I didn't always look to female athletes. And so now getting into the sport, like we're uh, obviously like there's a big female presence too. Um, Linda Murray, I mean, like, gosh, like did she pave the way? Um, and um, just seeing how much she continues to do with the sport has been so inspiring because you can do so much more after you compete. Um, Juliana Malacarn. I, when I think of women's physique and feminine muscle, that's what I think of. And regardless of whether or not that's what the division looks like anymore, I've always aspired to have my physique look very feminine yet muscular. And I think she has, she has always brought that. Um, and then uh, Natalia, my teammate, she came in second last year at the Miss Olympia of women's physique. She just won the New York Pro. Um, I mean, she's younger than me by quite a bit, but someone that just like, she's like the sweetheart of women's physique and women's bodybuilding, I feel like. And um, again, it's, I think, I think these women kind of bring the whole package and show that you can be muscular, but you can also be feminine and you can show that there's like this duality there that a lot of people really don't believe can happen. So as I've gotten more into the sport, I'd say those are three women, women that I've really looked up to. Awesome. So uh, tell us, Jess, um, at what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was a lifelong athlete. I played soccer and lacrosse. Um, when I was much younger, I played softball. I almost went to college to play lacrosse, but then decided I wanted to party more instead. So I went to a big party school. Um, <clears throat> but I was always an athlete. We lifted a little bit in high school, but it wasn't like a huge thing that we did. It was more obviously just like practicing your sport and conditioning. Um, and then in college, I really fell off. Like it just wasn't something I, was, I prioritized. Post-college, I moved to Washington, D.C. I was a lobbyist for a long time, which I'm sure we can talk about. Um, and fitness was not a priority. And um, as a result, like my health suffered. I developed a lot of like stress and anxiety induced heartburn and, and digestive issues. And so I avoided lifting for a really long time. And then when I realized that lifting actually helped and didn't exacerbate that, I'd say in my like mid to late 20s was when I really started to hit it hard again. Um, and then I got into CrossFit and all of my friends, that was my big catalyst getting back into fitness. And all of my friends were like, oh my God, like it's about time that you did something like this because you're so competitive. So really getting back seriously into lifting weights was uh, probably like 
27, 28. Um, but like I said, always a lifelong athlete. So I had a really good, strong base um, when I, when I really got back into lifting seriously. So I'm going to, I want to ask you this because uh, I own a gym and personal train and obviously have some interactions with, with uh, females and stuff when it comes to lifting weights. And I'm, uh, I, I mean, I train youth all the way up to like, you know, a lady that's 80 years old and everybody that I train, uh, I tell them that they're going to be lifting weights, whether they want to or not. Right. Because it's superior. Now I get a lot of females and I'm sure a lot of listeners, or a lot of people that are watching uh, this conversation are going to agree with me and agree with you. But uh, you know, a lot of females are afraid to lift weights because they say like, you know, to me, they're like, I don't want to look like you. I don't want to be <laughs> bulky. Like we we've all heard that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, now, is that, is that something, and I, I feel like I, I, I do want to give CrossFit a lot of credit, whatever you think about it. I do feel like they um, empowered women in terms of having a barbell in their hands and really open up the door for females specifically uh, to, to um, you know, just understand the importance of lifting weights. And, and they really opened a lot of doors that maybe weren't open in the past. Um, but in terms of females, and you know, their, their thoughts around lifting weights is, did you kind of have like those thoughts where it's like, I don't want to be bulky. I, you know, I don't want to look like a guy Were were those some of the thoughts that you had or some of your friends had, is that something that, that you kind of experienced or not per se? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm a, I'm a trainer as well. Like I work in fitness too. So I hear it from women all the time. Um, <clears throat> when I was getting into CrossFit, no, that wasn't my concern. Um, and like, strength and power has always been really rewarded and like put on a pedestal in my family. And like, we, we've always been athletes. So it was never a concern. We've always just been muscular anyway. So I never, I never viewed that as like, I don't want to look like that. Now, once I've gotten more into bodybuilding, if I look back, this is going to be my fourth show coming up this year. If I look back to where I started as like a baby figure athlete, and I say baby in relative to where I am right now, um, I still keep very much in the forefront of my mind. I don't want to get too big, but that's not to say that like lifting weights equals getting really big. So I know there's a lot of components that, that go into it. Um, but I, I, there's never been a point where I thought, okay, I can't lift weights because I'm going to get too bulky. Um, I just have to be mindful now that I'm like maybe maxing out where I want to be structure and frame wise that. I don't want to put on much more size, but I get a real, a, a lot of motivation, a lot of um, excitement from lifting really heavy. Like that's a, a, a sense of like accomplishment and pride for me. Um, and I have people like men and women, they're like, holy crap, I love your physique or I love your legs. Like that's the best part. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think strong, is, it's cliche, but strong is beautiful. And like whether or not you can see it or you can see someone perform strength, feats of strength, um, I've never been someone that's like, that steers away from it. It doesn't, it doesn't scare me. I just am mindful of what I want to look like. If that answers your question. Cool. All right. So I want to kind of get into uh, your backstory a little bit more. So you uh, kind of already uh, brought up that you, you were an athlete, you know, when you were younger. Yeah. And uh, so just tell us like where you grew up, Jess, talk about, you know, the soccer, the lacrosse, um, talk about, you know, family dynamics, maybe, um, you know, something that your parents instilled in you or talk about, you know, any uh, other mentors, coaches that had a strong influence in your life when you're younger up to about high school, and then we'll move on from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, those are some formative years. Yeah. So I like my dad and mom were both athletes growing up, um, like really, really strong foundation, both mentally and physically. Um, my dad was a wrestler, played football, uh, baseball. My mom was, a, um, was like into gymnastics and she's like, also did like weight training, strength training, like real, both really strong. Genetically, I've got a, a good uh, makeup, which is, which I'm very fortunate for. Um, and I was the, I'm the oldest of three. So it's myself, my sister's three years younger than me and my brother is 15 years younger than me. So that was a fun surprise when I was a freshman in high school my parents were like, and we're gonna have another child. And we're like, great, okay, fun. Um, but I was, since I was the first born, my dad almost treated me like the son he didn't yet have in regards to like sports and athletics and this like get tough mentality. So 
Um, I don't regret a moment of it because it has made me into the athlete and the human I am today. But growing up, it was like I it was like all or nothing with sports. And so and everything I did. Um, so a quick anecdote about um, playing lacrosse in, in high school. Um, like I said, I almost went to college to play lacrosse. Um, I was looking at SUNY Binghamton and um, had a scholarship offer to go there. Um, and I just remember thinking like, I don't really want to do this. This isn't the school I want to go to, but my dad really wants me to go and play because he had the opportunity to play college football. And then for a couple of different reasons, wasn't able to go through with it. So I felt like it was something that I should do, but at the end of the day, I didn't cause I wanted a different college experience. But, um, our, so I went to a, um, very small high school in Rockland County, New York. Um, so I live in Jersey city now, so not too far, about 45 minutes North. Um, the town, little town called Manuet. And when I was there, our women's lacrosse program made it to the New York State Final Four um, two years in a row. Um, I think they did it a few more times, but we were a, a very, the smallest school in our county, but, and, and arguably probably in, in one of the smallest in New York State, but consistently were performing at such an elite level. And it was cool to be playing with like these Amazon women that were like born and bred to play lacrosse from like Long Island and upstate New York. And um, so I, I've never been a very um, athletically gifted individual. I'm just hardworking and I'm like a freight train and we'll just, I, like I had no fear as a kid. So I'll just run through anything. Um, so our lacrosse team, it was tough to get onto the varsity team, even as like a junior, you know, typically like junior varsity is like freshman, sophomore, and then varsity is junior, senior, and there's exceptions. But even as a junior, it was a tough to get on that varsity team because they were so good. And so um, they all had these like black shirts and, and the, ca the team captains and the coach would give you an adjective on the back of your shirt, um, kind of like a jersey. And that adjective would be, it was voted on. And that's what like described you as your main attribute. And so I remember at the end of my sophomore year, I got pulled up to go with the team up to the New York State Final Four. And my dad was probably more excited than I was. <laughs> and he um, he was like, there was like a special like ceremony where you like go to one of the team captain's houses and you get your shirt and you find out what your word is. And my dad, I just remember him driving me over and being like, what do you think your word's going to be? What do you think your word's going to be? And I was like, I don't know, dad, I'm just excited. Like, I, I can't wait to see what it's going to be. And he's like, it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be tough. And sure as shit, I have this framed right here. It was tough. So they like, it was pretty cool because I got the shirt. And then I remember getting back in the car and he was like, he was like, hell, like, what was it? And I showed him, he's like, hell yes, this is awesome. Like he was more excited than I was. So, um, I mean, get tough has been the mentality that I grew up with in sports and just in life in general. And it was really cool to see that come to fruition and have coaches recognize it. Man, my lacrosse coach, Coach Leitner, like she was such, she was so, um, like such an inspiration in my formative um, high school years. Such a, a like a tough badass female coach that taught me like you just get shit done no matter what. And like her and my dad ended up being like really close because we had you know I had my younger siblings who came through for sports and stuff. So, um, so I'm really fortunate. I had some like really, really great role models in sports in high school, because even though I didn't come back around into athletics and sports for many years after that, it taught me so, so many life lessons that I constantly would come back to. And I didn't want to let those people down, regardless of whether or not I was playing that sport. Like I wanted to come back and be like, listen to all of these other things I've done. And now that I'm in bodybuilding, I mean, gosh, like my parents will tell me all the time, like, guess who I ran into at the restaurant or here or whatever. And they show them my pictures from competing. And they're like, I always knew that she would do great thing. You know how parents are when they run into people. Um, but yeah, it was, it was cool because we had a really good, strong background in athletics and sports um, and this like get tough mentality at home. And then I also had a really great support system as far as like coaches um, in high school as well. What was uh, the academic side of things like for you uh, when you were younger? Man, I was like one of those super well-rounded, like <laughs> I was class president. I was varsity sport athlete. I was a Girl Scout for 13 years. I was in the Italian club. I was in like, like active in church. Like my parents didn't let me stop. I did everything. And I appreciate it. At the time, I hated it, right? I was like, can I just relax? And then my, my parents had my brother. And so I was, you know, also helping out and babysitting.
but um, man, was I well-rounded. And it has taught me to be able to like, like juggle a lot of different things, but put forth effort um, in, in anything I do. Now, when I got to college, first semester of college, I almost flunked out. <laughs> that was just because I was like on my own for the first time. I was like, wow, this is what it's like to like not have someone on your ass all the time and making sure you're doing what you need to be doing. Um, so I, cause I partied a little bit too much in the beginning of college, but it kind of, it leveled out. I graduated early. I was good. Um, but I was, I was always a really, really good athlete. Like I said, I was class president four years in a row. I took, you know, AP classes, like I was always top of my class. Um, but I, I think it's because I was so well-rounded. My parents made sure I did everything. So, uh, what were you, cause you mentioned, uh, you moved to Washington at some point and were a lobbyist. Uh, I'm assuming that's probably not what you were planning on doing when you were in high school or am I, am I wrong? Um, in high school, I thought that I wanted to, um, I thought I wanted to go to law school at some point. And, um, but I also really liked, uh, biology. So when I went to, I went to university of Delaware for undergrad and I went with, um, I entered with the major with a bio major. Um, and I quickly realized that like the sciences were not for me. It's just not the way my brain worked. And so I switched over to international relations and languages and languages I flourished at. So I studied Spanish for 10 years. I studied Arabic for three years. Um, I got to work for the state department overseas at an uh, embassy in North Africa. Um, so I did a lot of really cool stuff, but I didn't in high school, didn't ever think that I would be doing a lot of what I ended up doing in, in college. Um, and then, but I still had the intention of going to law school. I thought that was something I really wanted to do. I made a bunch of friends in DC as I got more into like state department and I looked at FBI and, um, the advice I got was move to DC, work there first, like, uh, build up a network and then go to law school and go to law school in DC if you want to do something at the federal level. Um, so I, after I graduated, moved to DC and, um, started working as a paralegal, at an immigration firm and um, I was doing a lot of translating work and uh, it, I quickly realized it was not for me. And then I just kind of just started to find my way. I went through a couple different jobs, tried to figure out what I wanted to do and then um, ended up in um, like sale membership development and sales and business development for products that were for lobbyists. So for example, um, and for people that, you know, watch the podcast and may not be as familiar with what lobbyists do, very simple term. They represent a specific industry's interests to uh, whether it's at the federal, state, or local level. So I was at the federal level. Um, and so, for example, like let's talk, I ended up working for the restaurant industry. So um, we would go up to the White House or Capitol Hill and we would talk about uh, regulations and laws and different things that would impact that industry that maybe people at the federal level didn't understand. So before I got into the actual lobbying, I was helping people that were lobbying on behalf of different industries um, with best practices, like so they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So I got into that and then um, ended up going to work for one of the lobbyists that I, in the, one of the organizations that I had sold products to. So I mentioned the restaurant industry. I worked for the National Restaurant Association, and um, my boss was the chief was the chief lobbyist, and I was her chief of staff. So while I was doing all of this, like fitness wasn't a big priority, but I, I, as I was working at the National Restaurant Association, which was an amazing experience, you're eating and drinking everything. You were traveling nonstop. Like health was not my top priority. And I quickly realized that it had to be. And I just remember waking up on my 30th birthday and thinking, holy crap, like this is not the life that I want to be living. I'm not healthy. Um, but it was a, it was a very cool experience, loved what I did, but it was, it was my catalyst getting like back into fitness. So, so um, before we kind of get into the health side of things and fitness and bodybuilding and all that, um, during that time, like when you were in Washington DC and, and working at different jobs, doing the lobbying thing and all that, like during, it sounds like most of that took, took place in your twenties. Like what, like, did you find some sort of identity Jess, like during that time? Uh, or did you not find really identity until, uh, you were done in, in those type of careers? And then like, what were some of like the, the life lessons that you learned during that, that time period? Cause you know, whatever we're doing, whether we're passionate about it or not, there's, there are life lessons to be learned. So, um, was there an identity that you found during that time? Yes or no. 
Um, and then like, what were some of those life lessons during those uh, career experiences that you had during that time? That's a great question. I think, okay, this is going to sound kind of cheesy, but I was working in Washington when like the series House of Cards was coming out, right? And there's like opening credits in House of Cards. It was filmed along the street that I lived on. Like I was living in that time. And so I like my, in my head, my identity was like, oh, I'm like on House of Cards. <laughs> I wasn't, you know, like things weren't, weren't exactly like that. But um, it was what I had wanted for a long time. Like I felt important. I felt like I was doing meaningful work. I felt like I was representing people that didn't always necessarily have the opportunity to be represented. Um, and I, I felt like I was, uh, I did uh, kind of always have like this imposter syndrome where I was like, there's no way that I'm smart enough to do any of this. Like, why are people listening to me? But it was cool. And I had some really phenomenal mentors, mainly my, or, or most notably my um, boss when I was at in the working with the restaurant industry um who just kind of like took me under their wing and helped me develop that identity of like truly being a lobbyist i didn't realize i was a lobbyist until i was out of it you know like i was in it and i was like oh this is just what i do but when i got out of it i was like that's that's really what i was doing so um you know to be able to in my own definition and sense of the word be incredibly successful in my like before i turned 30 um, from like a career standpoint, from a financial standpoint, I mean, I felt really proud of what I was doing and then to be able to come back to my family and, and be like, look, all the things that you instilled in me, like I'm, I'm building this career. Um, however, I realized, I mentioned like, you know, I woke up when I was 30 and realized I was healthy and happy. I realized like I just kept failing forward. So I was doing the things that I thought I was supposed to be doing, but did I ever try, truly find fulfillment in what I was doing? I realized I, I didn't. Um, and there were things that I really enjoyed. So I really enjoyed um, hiring young professionals and like mentoring them and coaching them. I loved teaching. I loved sales and business development, but did it have to be specific to um, a specific industry or to lobbying as a whole? Not necessarily. And so when I realized that fitness was what I wanted to get more into, um, I had this like crazy identity crisis where I was like, this is what I've worked so hard for for so long. And when you're like 30, you think like so long, but really there's so much more of your life. <laughs> like it's a good time to go through a career change. Um, but I did like a, a, an eat, pray, love trip. I took a summer off and I went to Europe for almost eight weeks and um, I didn't know anyone. I went on this big group trip where I didn't know anyone and just like found myself and figured out what I wanted to do. And at the end of the day, I was like, I'm really good at, like I said, teaching, coaching, uh, sales. Um, and I, I'm very entrepreneurial. Like I love to do things on my own. And maybe it's under the larger autonomy of like a larger umbrella or, or under the a larger umbrella, but like having the autonomy to do my own thing. So I was like, I, I love fitness now. I've gotten into fitness. I've gotten into CrossFit. So that was my catalyst into getting into fitness as a, a career path. Um, but it, it's, it took me a long time to like build that new identity because I was like, fitness was only one piece of it. How do you make that one piece now the centerpiece um, when you've done all of these other things? And I will say like, um, it actually wasn't that tough of a transition initially because in DC at, the, at least, um, working so close to um, politics and working so close to like um, public affairs, you, it, it, the question is always, what do you do and who do you work for, right? It's a town of like status. And so to say that I didn't anymore was almost like people would look down on me, but to say that I had and I could speak their language automatically gave me a leg up over people in fitness that couldn't speak the language. So I automatically was getting very high profile clients, like top reporters, top lobbyists, like top attorneys, partners at, at big firms, because they were like, oh, like she gets my busy schedule. She understands when I can and cannot train. She can help me with proper nutrition because she knows I'm, this is what my day looks like. Um, and I can have an actual conversation with her while I'm training and it's not someone who doesn't get it. So um, and it's a very long winded way to answer your question of, I, it was tough to, to change kind of my identity there. Um, but I, it was a, it was a probably more seamless transition than it might've been for someone else who needed a career change, um, in DC. So, so uh, I would love to have you just kind of just talk about, 
um, the, the health side of things when you kind of like, you know, you said you turned 30 and you realized like, you know, health wasn't a priority and it needed to be. So what was kind of some of those health issues, if you don't mind talking about that, that kind of like opened up your eyes. So like, Hey, like I, I need to, I need to make a shift. I need to make some changes in my life in terms of my health. Yeah. Okay. A quick story. So for work, we had got, we tried, like I said, we travel over time. We went to New Orleans quite a bit. I love New Orleans. <laughs> it's so good. The food, the drink, everything. And we had this big conference and I was super stressed because I was filling in for my boss. And again, imposter, imposter syndrome seeped in. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. So how did I cope? I went to all of the events that were part of the conference and I drank and I ate. And then when my boss got there and I was like off the hook, man, did I drink. And I remember like we had an early flight when the conference was done. And so like, I'm super hungover, probably still drunk. We go to the airport and I like lay down on the chairs at the gate and I just pass out. And I thought I was like in a safe space, but really a bunch of like high profile folks from the conference and from my organization were there and they like saw me passed out on the chairs. Now everyone knows, like everyone had been out drinking, but they were like, is that Jess? Like what's going on? And for me, even though it might've been acceptable and everyone else was doing it, I was like, that is just not how I want to come across. And I remember coming home and looking in the mirror the next morning after I like passed out the night before and just being like, A, I don't love the way I look right now. B, I hate the way I feel. Um, and C, I'm embarrassed. Like, this is just not where I want to be. And I was, um, at that point, I had just started CrossFit a few months earlier, I, but I really wasn't doing anything else. I wasn't focusing on nutrition. Um, and I was like, I've got to do something. I've got to do something about my health. Like, this is not what I want to be doing. Um, and so I started working with a nutritionist um, and like just focus, I had been meal planning for years, but like really focusing on what worked for me. Um, and then I had that, I mentioned earlier, that nagging heartburn issue. And that had been like coming in waves for years. And we could never, like, I got so many endoscopies. I had went to try out so many different pharmaceuticals. Like we could not figure out what it was. Like talked to therapists, did acupuncture. Um, but once I really got into fitness, I mean, I can tell you, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've had heartburn in the past few years. And it really, it's just been when I've had a crazy indulgent meal or if something really, really stressed me out. So I really, I figured out through focusing on my health that I had stress-induced heartburn. And it's a real thing. Like stress manifests in so many different ways for people. For me, it was heartburn. Um, and when I was in my early 20s, like I shrunk down to like the tiniest little thing because I couldn't eat anything. And then I was able to eat as I got you know, later into my 20s and I worked these jobs, but heartburn was like a daily thing. Right. And it was not only because of my poor lifestyle choices, but because of stress and I wasn't addressing a lot of underlying issues. Um, and so once I focused on my health and eating healthier, moving more, fitting in my workouts, but also figuring out what I wanted to do with my life <laughs> and like um, and perhaps addressing some other like um, like mental health issues, anxiety, just figuring out how to fix all of that to be a better person that I mean, it was just. I always say I wish that experience on a lot of people, that transformative moment where they can figure out um, ways and tools to just be happier and function better. Um, and it, it sucks that it happened when I was 30 and not earlier, but I mean, it's great that it didn't happen much later. So yeah, the heartburn was a really big one. Um, and it just being like, uh, just generally unhealthy. Like I was never massively overweight, but like, body fat to lean muscle mass on my body. Like I definitely had a higher body fat percentage and that can lead to a lot of um, major health issues down the road. I mean, in my family, we've got some heart issues. We've got diabetes, we've got breast cancer, like all things that could manifest had I not taken control of my health. So, um, so yeah, I fortunately caught it early and, and we're healthy. So, so uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, CrossFit. And how did you kind of get introduced to that? How long did you do it? How did it kind of help you? And then talk about why you decided to maybe transition out of CrossFit and kind of get into more of the physique type uh, uh, competing. Yeah. Um, I always saw CrossFit and was like, well, at first I thought it was stupid. <laughs> and then I was like, I, I was like, you know what? I'm really competitive and I like to lift heavy things. Like I'm going to try it. 
And I remember that first day I walked in and it was one of the like hero workouts. And I had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. Man, was that tough. And I just, but I remembered feeling really accomplished because the thing I like, there's a lot of things I like about CrossFit, even though I don't do it regularly anymore. Um, but I liked that there was a leaderboard. I liked that I could compete against other people. I liked that I could log my workouts and then compare the same workout over time to see how I improved. Um, and I liked the class format because at that time I just needed the opportunity to like have a workout presented to me that I was going to do. And it was at a set time and that was it. And if I missed the class, then I was screwed or like maybe I could go to a later one. But um, I was I hadn't yet built the ha the habits of getting to the gym every day when I was working full time. So um, and it was great because the more I got into it, my boss at the time, she knew that was important for me from a health perspective and a, a physical and a mental health perspective. So she knew the last class, for example, was like 8 p.m. on Monday through Thursday. So she knew even if we had a bunch of stuff going on, as long as I got out by 730, she was like, get out so you can get to your CrossFit class, unless it was like, you know, some extenuating circumstance. So um, I really loved it. And I made a lot of friends and it was a great um, community gym in DC. They have four locations, shout out to Balance Gym. Like they, I've become like, they've become like family to me, the owners there, the other coaches there. Um, and they actually had a really phenomenal CrossFit program. They had a team that went to the CrossFit games every year. So we were around really great athletes. Um, it was very motivating. I am like naturally very strong. So it was, it was also motivating to go and just like crush people on squats and deadlifts like these guys that are like twice my size are like how are you squatting three times your body weight like how does this happen so it was motivating um and then when I one of the coaches there he was my nutrition coach so that helped me just see my physique transform and I was like wow like I've got some good genetics here um I was way more into so once I didn't think CrossFit was stupid anymore I thought bodybuilding was stupid. <laughs> and I remember literally watching bodybuilders. I was like, oh my God, that's so stupid. Like they're starving themselves and they're depriving themselves. Like I'm going to eat whatever I want or like as much as I want and perform. Like I like performance athletics. And then I thought about doing some powerlifting and I was like getting ready for my first powerlifting, like very small meet, like nothing big time, but just to see kind of what I could do. And I hurt my back. Not in like a very bad way, but it was one of those where I did too much in too short a time. Um, and so I wouldn't be able to do the, the, the powerlifting at all. And then it just got me thinking about like, um, if I wanted to keep like beating my body up that way, or if there was something else I wanted to try. And again, I'm very competitive. So I wanted something to work towards. And my coach at the time, he was like, he was a competitor and he was like, or a, a bodybuilder. He was like, you know what? I keep telling you, like, this might be something that you should try. Like, look at your physique now and you haven't even really done body part splits. And I was like, you know what? It was like, a, it's probably April, May. And there was a show at the end of August in right in outside of DC. And I was like, you know what? Why not? It's summer. I'll look hot for the summer. Like, I, it's fine. I can do, and that was right after, it was like um, six months after I had made the transition into working in fitness full time. So I was like, this is perfect. Um, and I did my first show and I never looked back. Like it, I was just hooked. And now I coach CrossFit currently. I coached it for a long time when I was in DC. Um, I also work a lot with, with, um, power lifters and CrossFitters. So I love that. And I, um, when there's room, like in my off season or maybe post bodybuilding, I will absolutely incorporate more of the like high intensity functional fitness. Um, but if there's always a special place in my heart for CrossFit, but bodybuilding is kind of where I'm at today. Um, so, uh, before we go any further with the bodybuilding talk, how did you kind of like go from what you were doing in terms of your lobbyist career, uh, over to fitness? Like, did it take time? Did you just like walk in one day, say I quit and then go right into to fitness? Cause I think a lot of people, uh, and I, it's not, I think, I, I know a lot of people at that point where like, they're unhappy in their job, they're unhappy in their career. They're maybe at a place where you were at, like, Hey, like, I got to figure some things out. They, they really love fitness, but like, it's always scary, you know, changing, especially when you have like a secure job and maybe you have a family, like, how did that work for you just to kind of go from point A to point B going from having a career, like, you know, what you were doing 
to being, you know, a coach and a trainer and nutritionist and all that? What, what were those steps? What did that look like for you? Yeah, um, that's a great question because you're right. Like there's steps, but there's also like everyone's path is different. Mm -hmm. um, and so my boss was leaving the organization and I was kind of just attached to her. And so when, when her role didn't exist anymore, my role didn't exist anymore. So I saw the writing on the wall. And it, it also just lined up really well with some other organizational changes and me um, like having this like epiphany that I wasn't happy in that job anymore. So it was all, it all kind of built to a head. And so when I left that organization, um, I had lots of other opportunities within the typical DC sphere. So my former boss, she went off to start her own uh, venture and she's gone on to, to start off many since then. And she asked me to come with her. I had a couple of other organizations reach out and they wanted to set up interviews. I had, like, I mean, I had a lot of people that, that wanted to work with me, fortunately, and I turned all of them down. And I, it was terrifying, but I knew in my gut that I, I said, I'm never going to do something again where I wake up and dread going to do it. Like sometimes you wake up and you're like, oh man, I don't want to go to work today. Or like, I don't want to go do this or Sunday scaries, but I promised myself I was never going to truly have the Sunday scaries where I didn't want to do, I didn't love what I was going to be doing all week. And um, in order to be comfortable in that, in that um, decision, a few things go into it. So A, I was single. I didn't have anyone else depending on me. I was renting. So I didn't have a lot of like these huge obligations. Um, now, mind you, I didn't, it's not like I really had a lot to fall, like fall back on. I had great savings, which like held me over for a while. Um, but it's not like I had like, you know, I wouldn't ask my parents for help. Um, I didn't have like family money to fall back on. So I had worked hard and made a lot of money in my twenties and saved a bunch. So I knew I had time. Um, but, uh, but I also didn't have a lot of other things to take care of and people relying on me. So I'll, I'll get, add that caveat because if someone has a whole family they have to support and they're thinking about this, there's probably a lot of other steps they're going to have to obviously go through. Um, and then I, I, I've also been, I, my first coaching jobs were within the gyms that I was already going to. I was already a part of the community. People liked me. Um, and I think that's a big part of it too. Like I, I say that like in passing and in jest almost, but like people liked me, they wanted to work with me. And so when I went to the, my very first coaching job was at an F45. So for people that aren't familiar, it's a, um, it's a franchise F stands for functional. So functional 45 minutes, it's a class that you take. It's like CrossFit light. Um, and it was in fact, and started, started in Australia four women that were too intimidated to go to CrossFit. So they created this 45 minute workout. Um, so there was a, an F45 studio in DC that was owned by the same guys that owned Fallon's gym where I was already working out and doing CrossFit. So I went to them and I was like, Hey, like, I want to just learn how to coach. Like, I know I could be really good at it. Um, but I, I don't know where to start. And they were like, you know what? Why don't you shadow? Why don't you be like an assistant coach? You don't have any certs yet, but like, we'll give you this opportunity. And it was honestly because they liked me and because I was a good athlete. Um, and that goes a long way. <laughs> I'm not saying that to like toot my own horn, but like if people like you, they're going to give you a chance. Um, and I just was like, look, this is what I can bring to the table. Like I'll be motivating. I'll work hard, whatever. And from there, um, then my, our CrossFit director um, asked me, Hey, like you're coaching over there, but you take CrossFit. Have you ever thought about being a CrossFit coach? And I was like, no, we're the best CrossFit box in DC. Like I didn't think I had a chance. They're like, if you get your level one certification, then you could be an assistant coach here and work your way up to head coach. And I was like, okay. So I dropped the thousand dollars, got the level one cert, passed the first time. And they hired me as a coach. Then I was coaching both of those places. Then the gym was like, Hey, we need female personal trainers. You ever thought about doing that? I was like, why not? So these opportunities kept coming my way. And I said, yes, 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 yes. And I figured out what my niche was. I figured out what I liked doing, um, demographics I liked coaching, demographics that I didn't like coaching. Um, and then I started my own business in January, 2020, and then the world shut down. So then we took a lot of different turns, but um, I didn't have a traditional plan. Like a lot of people say that you should have. Um, I just made sure to, um, keep my options open, say yes to things that were thrown my way, even if they didn't think they would be a good fit. 
Um, and at the end of the day, it was just me I had to take care of. I was very fortunate. I could have asked my parents for help if I needed to. I could have asked friends for help. But um, I was very fortunate that I didn't have to at any point. Um, and things, I mean, there are ebbs and flows. And I'm sure, you, as you know, in fitness, like there's high seasons, there's low seasons. So you like learn that stuff. But um, was there a roadmap? No, I kind of just winged it a little bit. <laughs> so. Cool. I, I like that. That's, that's uh, sometimes that's uh, the most exciting and uh, where a lot of learning happens when you're just like, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to go with the flow and see what life presents. Um, so let's get into bodybuilding talk. Uh, so it sounds like, you know, one of the, uh, one of the coaches that you were around competed and he's like, Hey, think about doing this. It sounds like you decided to compete, uh, you know, later on in that year after he kind of presented that to you. So yeah. talk about your first competition. Uh, did you have anybody helping you? What was the experience like? Were you like hooked right away? Just kind of start unpacking the, the bodybuilding scene for us in your life, Jess. Yeah. So first show uh, was the Capitol Grand Prix in Washington, D.C. Um, and I had a prep coach who was the same coach that kind of got me into bodybuilding. And then um, I had a posing coach as well, who was one of the, their good friends. Um, and they just kind of like helped to open my eyes to what bodybuilding was. And so I competed in figure for my first show on women's physique now. Um, and I just, I had never been to a bodybuilding show before my show. I don't recommend this. I recommend people go to shows <laughs> and see what they're like, because I showed up to the venue. So we had the athlete check-in meeting in the morning. We went back to the hotel. I showed up based on how my coaches had seen the show run previous years, I showed up and they were calling my number on stage. <laughs> so I was not even in the venue and we walk in and my like dad and my sister had come down and they're there and they're like, number 24, number 24. I didn't and you figure you were heels, right? Women's physique, thank goodness. I didn't have my shoes on. I hadn't pumped up. I didn't get an extra like coat of tan. I didn't get glaze. I did my own tan, my own hair, my own makeup. The suit didn't fit me. I mean, comedy of errors. And we and they're calling my number and we're racing backstage. My uh, posing coach and my sister are shoving my feet in the shoes. And I get on stage and I'm like, that adrenaline is going, right? And I have never been to a show. So I don't know what order. I don't know what's happening. They're just like, go here, move here, do this, do this. Um, I ended up taking uh, first in true novice, second in novice, and uh, second in class A. So I was nationally qualified <laughs> after all of that. So I get to the end of the day and I'm like, did I, did I win? Did I do good? And my, everyone's like, yeah, you did great. <laughs> so I was happy um, when I look back on it and real, like once I understood how shows ran, when I look back on it later, I was like, holy shit. Like <laughs> I, I should have gone to a show before. So I understood just how things were because now I'm such an over planner, over preparer. Um, like I will, if I fly to a show or have to travel for a show, I'm getting there like three days early. Um, and I'm not leaving after the competitors meeting without exact confirmation of the times that I'm expected to be somewhere. I'm not going to trust someone else's eyes. It, I don't blame that this on anyone. It was, I mean, whatever happened happened and I did well and it was great, but um, it was, it was a really funny start to my bodybuilding career. And so I, I knew when I walked off stage, like, I was like, Oh, this is for me because I like that. Like I'm never, I, I'm, I'm always going to win. I'm always going to win. Like, that's just who I am. I'm not, I'm not satisfied just showing up and just showing off my hard work. Like I thrive on doing well and beating others. Um, no matter like, however that sounds. <laughs> um, so I knew after showing up and doing really well, I was like, oh yeah, like this is for me. I wanted, that was a week before North Americans. And, um, I really wanted to do North Americans, but I, again, didn't understand how you went from a local show to a national show to becoming a pro. Like I was so new to this. And my, um, posing coach was like, she was, a, she's a women's physique pro. She was like, yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. And my coach, my prep coach, um, was like, no, like you're going to get destroyed at nationals. Like you're, it's, this is not for you and you should do women's physique. You should not do figure. I wish I hadn't had not listened to them and I'd listened to my posing coach. Um, however, whatever things happened the way they did. So I didn't end up going to North Americans. Um, I took a year 
and then so that was 2019 um and the big like the week before all the gyms shut down in 2020 i ended up hiring a new prep coach so i'd worked with someone in the off season to help me with like um just i didn't know what an off season was but just to help keep me on track and then i hired a new prep coach and i planned to do um whatever the first national show was that year um I think it was still at that point was junior USA's and um, I was like, I think I need to do women's physique, but I'm not entirely sure. So I was trusting this prep coach to help me with that. Um, they did their best, but everything got shifted that year. And so my first real off season, my first time, like thinking about national shows, everything kept getting kicked down the road. But for me, having a routine, having a plan, having something to work towards, even if the goalposts kept getting moved, kept me sane during such a crazy time. Um, so I was fortunate that the gym that I worked at, they helped set me up in my apartment with like a home gym so I could still train clients and shh, don't tell people, but, um, but I trained myself too. And I stuck to a meal plan. And so I ended up like that prep was like six months long. Um, and I made it to, I ended up going back to my former coach and we made it to junior USA's. Um, <laughs> that former coach ended up dropping me as a client during peak week awful experience and I won't get into all the drama there very bad experience though so my posing coach the same posing coach she took me through the finish line and I finished second in class a so at a bigger show I would have been a pro but it was a small show so I finished second in class a and it was the first time I had stepped on a national stage second show ever first time I ever did women's physique and I was like okay like the, I'm I'm here like this is my division um so I thought about doing another show after that because Junior USA's at that point had been pushed so far that North Americans, again, was close. And I was like, you know what? I am taxed. My body is taxed. My mind is taxed. I just lost my coach. I've been prepping for six months. And I was just, I, I threw the towel in. I was like, nope. So I took another off season, hired another coach, um, worked with that coach. Off season was great. I made some phenomenal gains create a lot of detail in areas that I wanted to create detail. And then I um, wanted to get ready for uh, universe um, because being a New York, New Jersey girl, I really wanted to do universe. And that coach um, decided that they did not want me to get ready for universe. And they had a lot of other things going on with their athletes. So I was like, you know what? I want to do uh, universe. I'm going to hire a coach that's going to bring me there. Um, ended up not doing universe, ended up doing junior USA's, which was even sooner. And I hired my current coach, Andrew Vu. Um, and that's who I've been with since, um, uh, last year, last January. So over a year now I've been with him. Um, so he brought me going back to junior USA's and I, the, on the advice from a lot of people, they were like, no, go back to where you took second and you show those judges, you made the improvements and you deserve that pro card. I took second place again. <laughs> so pissed <laughs> but you know what it's like different competitors show up each time so when i compare my photos from 20 and 21 i made massive improvements mm -hmm. and i was with a new coach like he we had to learn how we worked together he had to learn how my body reacted to different things um but what we also learned is i ran into a bunch of health issues as i was getting on stage last year um, and it was just from like years of just like constantly going, going, going in the sport. Um, and my body was just exhausted. So we like, like my thyroid wasn't doing great. My kidneys, my liver, like nothing was, was really functioning where we wanted it to be. And which was beyond frustrating because I felt like last year was the year that I was going to like continue until I got that pro card after junior USA is we planned to do another show. We kept trying to go and then got blood work back and we're like, nope, like we pushed a little bit too hard. We're not going to do it. So then it took a really long health phase, really long off season. And now we're just under 13 weeks out from our next national show. So um, I never thought that I would be kind of where I am. I never thought that I'd want to end up being a pro. I never thought that I would have dreams of being on the Olympia stage, but um, it, I, each year I learned a little bit more. And my goal now is to be able to do more than one show in a year and really like rock it once I become a pro. So I want to just, uh, again, cause I think maybe you're like the third female that I've had on the podcast. Uh, and, and I know that there are some ladies that listen. So, you know, uh, like the health, the health side of things, going back to, you know, you start getting into competing, 
you're competing in the NPC, uh, you know, there's certain uh, PEDs and just different chemicals that you have to take. Like, how does all of that factor into uh, some of that health stuff that you've gone through? Um, what would you say to the ladies that are out there that were in your place when you got into the, to the sport that you, you didn't know anything about anything? And I know, uh, and, and a lot of people that are watching or listening to this know that there's, you know, uh, prep coaches out there uh, that know that you don't know anything and they're going to tell you to take this or take that or do this or do that. And I think it's important for somebody like you, uh, Jess, that's on the, the come up in terms of. Uh, women's physique and bodybuilding uh, to kind of just speak to the ladies out there like hey these are some things when you're looking for a coach these are some things when you're thinking about competing that you need to think about as a woman because it's a whole different ball game in terms of some of the stuff that you know uh, guys take and then you know women are taking it it's just it's it can get kind of messy and can get kind of crazy so just speak on that however you kind of want to take that please sure. So um, <clears throat> when I picked Andrew as my coach, my current coach, um, my former posing coach, who was a physique pro, she had worked with him. So I already knew um, and had like worked intimately with a, a, an athlete who had worked with him. Um, so I heard great things, but I've, I had reached out to a lot of other coaches prior to him. Um, and what I did and what I would encourage anyone to do, but women really to do is research their other athletes and look at their other athletes. And then for women in particular, maintaining your femininity is incredibly important. Um, if it's not for you, that's okay too. But, um, there are a lot more ramifications for women than there are for men in the sport, especially if you're going to be taking PED, um, or just in general, if you're going to push your body to the, like such low body fat percentages, if you want to have children at some point, and this is just plain and simple, like you have to really consider the, the levels that you're going to be pushing your extremes, you're going to be pushing your body to. Um, and so I did a lot of research into the other female athletes that these coaches had worked with, what they looked like, what their voices sounded like, if they had families, if they went on to have careers, like, unfortunately, for women, we have to think a little bit more about this stuff than men do. But I would encourage anyone to, to look at the health status of, the, of athletes that your potential coach has worked with. Um, so that's a big one that, that I would encourage. Just like research those athletes and, and see. Um, I mean, there was probably about this time last year, there was a lot of discussions on different podcasts about some of one coach in particular, but a few coaches that were working with female athletes and these these women were dying, right? And it's not, you can't necessarily say it's all because of this coach, but um, do your research, right? Like you have to think, you have to find out um, if any of these athletes have gotten sick, have gotten injured, have unfortunately passed away. Um, but the other side of the coin there is do your due diligence. So when you go to work with a coach, ask all the questions like they work for you at this like i respect my coach to the end of the earth and i'm gonna listen to what he tells me to do but because i've instilled trust in him and i trust the process and i trust him because i did my due diligence i did my research um so ask questions ask don't feel like any question is silly or stupid like ask hey when you prep a woman for a national level physique competition what are macro sources? What are PEDs that you might recommend? What is the depletion process? What does the peak week look like? If a coach gets it, they may not give you like terribly wordy, lengthy answers, and that's okay. But if they answer your questions, that's that's a start. If they get annoyed with your questions, then that's probably not a coach for you, right? Um, so it's like, oh, I always say to people like, own your space, ask your questions. If you don't get the answers you like, go find a coach that works better for you. And not every coach is going to work for every person. Um, the other piece too is, I mean, you mentioned the, the PEDs and, and we're talking about women's health. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of women and a lot of coaches will push women in that peak week on uh, hard on um, diuretics. Um, and I'm not like, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this, but um, women hold more body fat than men. Like that's, we know that. Um, and a lot of times people, both men and women will turn to diuretics to like shred out that last week. Right. So they're like, I'm going to get out the extra water weight. Like I'm going to look really peeled, really diced. 
but if you your body fat is low enough like you don't necessarily need any of that um, and oftentimes um, diuretics are abused by both men and women but it happens a lot with women because we naturally have more body fat mm -hmm. so I, it hasn't happened to me I, I do know a few women it's happened with um, where the diuretics have been pushed really, really, really hard. And to put it in perspective, a woman could be taking, um, I'm not going to give specific examples, but taking certain PEDs across like a, a 16 week prep and do less damage in the 16 weeks than she could in one day of overdoing it with diuretics. Mm -hmm. Diuretics can be so, 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 so harmful for our our kidneys, for our liver, for our thyroid, for, for our heart, like for so much. And so not saying it's always women specific it can be happen to you know physique athletes both men and women but it happens a lot with women because we tend to have more body fat and so you're trying to achieve that incredibly peeled diced inside outlook and the diuretics will be pushed really really hard so um that's i always ask that question too and i encourage women to find out like what does that protocol look like because even if you haven't pushed peds really hard they may I really encourage to like manipulate the water and then pull in diuretics and then there's that's ir like irreversible damage um quick anecdote so i was talking to my coach recently and and i've heard a lot of feedback from people that have seen me um, getting ready for shows they're like are you women's bodybuilding or are you women's physique and i'm like i'm women's physique but i've thought about maybe doing both divisions to as a pathway to the pro card but i'm not sure i don't want to compete as a pro in women's bodybuilding it's just not my goal so I proposed this question to my coach during my last check-in and his feedback was just phenomenal. He was like, no, you compete in the division that you, you go pro in the division you want to be a pro and you want to compete as a pro, A. And B, he said to me, he was like, you also have to think about the rest of your life and what you want to do outside of bodybuilding and after bodybuilding. Once you lose your femininity, there's no coming back from that. And he could not be more right in saying that. Um, again, if someone chooses to do that, that is, 100% okay. But for me, I want to stay as feminine as I can. I think you can still be muscular, you can still compete in this division. Um, but there are those are things that you want to think about. And for me, having a coach that can add that perspective is incredibly valuable, because had he not said something like that, I may, I may have considered doing both divisions, I may have considered, like, you don't always see in the mirror what someone else sees. And then I, I recently did like a, uh, I started a YouTube series, and I was watching myself in the video. I was like, holy crap, is that what my back looks like? Like, I didn't, you don't see it. So to have a coach that can ask you those questions and, and give you those like reality checks, um, I'm very lucky. I encourage people to ask the right questions so that they can find the right coach for them. Great advice. Um, we're going to start wrapping up our conversation here, Jess. But uh, before we do, um, what... Uh, what do you, what do you, uh, in terms of like, let's get into training talk just for a minute here. What's, what's kind of like your, your philosophy um, has Andrew uh, does he help you with your training? Has he brought anything in terms of changing your training? Talk about kind of the, the training evolution for you personally, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Andrew weighs in on my training. He doesn't like design everything for me, um, but he's give, I generally have a split that he likes for me to follow. So I do three days on, one day off, two days on, one day off. We were at 3131 for a while, um, but I tend to get a little more inflamed. Um, like my body just doesn't, in the past, hasn't recovered as quickly as I would like it to. Um, probably also because I go hard. Like I lift with intense intent and intensity. Um, I love to lift heavy and that's been a challenge too because he's had to rein me in on stuff. Um, so I, as a trainer myself, um, I've had trainers work with me and they're, they've had to rein me in too. And the focus has always been time under tension, um, drop the weight, maybe don't go crazy high reps, but like make each rep count, right? You don't need to have those forced reps until maybe the last set and maybe the last few reps. That's my philosophy for my physique. Um, I, and that's mainly because I don't have to put on more size. We don't want more size. We just want detail. We want shape. We want structure. Um, now I also coach like guys that want to put on a lot of size. So I'm not going to make the same, I don't have the same approach with them. However, I'm not going to ever sacrifice form for weight. And I think it's just like training one-on-one. -on -one. Um, 
So our current split on Mondays, I'll do shoulders. On Tuesdays, I do hamstrings and glutes. Wednesdays, I do chest and arms. Thursdays, I rest. Fridays is back. And Saturdays is quads and glutes. And then Sundays, I rest. Um, I'm a big believer in two leg days. I'm known for my legs. Um, and the challenging part for me has been pulling back the weight on those leg days. And just everything is intensity, drop sets, like rest, pause, pause, reps, time under tension, angles. Um, I'm a firm believer in training the glutes. I'm a certified glute specialist, and I could spend hours talking about why the glutes are so important for so many reasons. And I know you get this, Quentin, from an athletic perspective, right? Like, so important. But in, in physique athletics, I mean, shows are one from the back. If you don't have glutes, then you're probably not going to do well, men or women. I'm <laughs> just throwing it out there. <laughs> um, so I always make sure to incorporate those on both of my lower body days. Um, for a while, we had chest and arms separate, but I have put them together again because rest is so important. And having that extra rest day for me um, is really, really important, especially after. So think about like I do back on Friday and quads and glutes on Saturday. Those are two big days. So today, Sunday, like I am all too happy to rest and not do anything. Um, a lot of my clients are not big on rest. A lot of people I talk to are not big on rest and recovery. When are you going to grow? When are you, is your body going to recover unless you take time out of the gym, right? The, the gym is the fun part. It's what we do outside of the gym that, that creates that full discipline. So um, I make my lifting sessions intense and um, the way this is a, pretty messed up way to think about things but like if I've got 12 weeks until my show I've got 12 chest and arm days right like I've got to make the most of those and every time I lift I'm reminding myself of that so um, it helps me keep the intensity high keep form really good um, and then I'm not a big logbook person I just it's all kind of up here but it's also kind of how I feel so I work you know, I've got a full-time job. I've got my business. I train clients. So not every day is going to be the same based on all the other variables I have. So if I'm feeling the same on my like RPE rate of perceived exertion scale, like if I'm still lifting at an eight to 10. If the weight's a little bit different, that's okay. Um, Cause I know I'm getting the same output out of that workout. So I could go on about like my, my strategy for lifting for a long time, but that's, those are some of the things I think about. Perfect. Now, uh, you mentioned recovery. I'm a huge uh, recovery uh, junkie myself, just because I know that's, I mean, that's where, that's where everything that we want to happen in terms of uh, mu muscle hypertrophy growth happens. Uh, so like for myself, like I go to the chiropractor once a week, go get uh, uh, body work done once a week. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what does your recovery look like in terms of days off? Are they like, you have act active recovery days? Are they completely days off? Do you go get body work done? Talk about that for a couple minutes. Sure. Yeah. So um, right now we do, I'll talk specifically because we're getting ready for a show. Um, although it doesn't differ a whole lot in the off season, maybe the cardio just changes a bit, but right now we're at fasted cardio five days a week. And then I have cardio post lifting sessions as well. So five days a week. So for example, my Thursdays, which is a rest day from lifting, I'm still up doing my fasted cardio in the morning. And then I'm just making sure I'm getting my steps in, right? Like I'm not doing anything crazy. Um, whether I'm training clients, whether I'm sitting at a desk, um, Thursday is generally cause I'm, it's still the work week. Sunday is a full complete rest day for me. I don't do any cardio. I may go out for a walk. I may go lay by the pool later today. Like, but I'm going to make sure I'm going to get some steps in, but equally important is putting my feet up. So I've got, um, I've got like a number of like recovery thing. Like I've got my massage gun. I've got like, um, the, the name's escaping me, the boots that I'll put on and like, um, like help with like muscle recovery and blood flow. Um, but I'm like making sure that I am literally putting my feet up. The other day I was going to work and it was Thursday, it was my rest day. And I was, I took the elevator up one flight of stairs. Now I don't normally do this, but an older gentleman who was there, he like comes in and he's like, you should be taking the stairs. And I had this this thought in my head to be like, oh, shut the fuck up. Like, you don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but, but honestly, like I was giving my legs a rest because I had killed them earlier in the week. So I didn't need to go up the flight of stairs for a lifestyle athlete, like a, a lifestyle client. I'd be like, yeah, take the stairs. 
But for me, I'm trying to reduce inflammation and like get those lines out in my legs. I'm taking every chance to recover. And then after each meal, I try to go for like a five, 10 minute walk to help with motility and digestion, all that. Um, I do get body work done. Eat, shout out to EJ. If anyone's in the New York, New Jersey area, EJ's great. Um, and you can always shoot me a DM and I'll, I'll hook you up with him. But he, um, he's been really, really great. I had an awesome guy, um, with, uh, Tino with Witted Wellness in the DC area, if anyone's there. Um, but body work, very important. Um, when I can, I try to do it once a week when schedules allow and finances allow. Um, but leading up to a show at least once every, um, one to two weeks is when I'm going. Um, and it may be just for like a tune up for me, it's always going to be, I always have like some nagging left trap stuff and then my legs to reduce inflammation and to get out the lines in my legs. Um, Epsom salt baths. I hate taking baths. <laughs> Unless I'm like at a hotel or something. <laughs> I hate taking baths. I get so much anxiety sitting there, but Epsom salt baths are so important. Um, and so I try to do them on Sundays, like before the week starts, to, and because it, it's a full rest day for me. Um, but rest and recovery is just so important. And I actually, I'll add this Sundays are also my day off from work, too. So I take one full day off. I don't answer client emails, nothing. Like everyone knows that Sundays are my day off. Um, because the mental rest is just as important as the, the physical rest. Um, and that's something that I um, was almost forced to do by my coach, Andrew. He was like, he's like, you have to take a full rest day <laughs> from everything because the stress, like the mental stress of everything else can weigh on you physically. So um, I also will make sure I have a hard and fast bedtime every night. Sleep. If you, I say this to my clients all the time. If you're not mastering water, sleep, and stress management, you have no business doing anything else because you're not going to make progress. So I have a rule with myself um, that my training partner helped me make sure I install or instill. Um, I put a reminder on my calendar for when I go to sleep. I know what time I have to get up and do my cardio in the morning. If I'm going to get less than six hours of sleep, I'm not doing my fasted cardio in the morning, and I will do it in a fasted state either after my workout or since I do faster cardio five days a week, it will just go kick to the weekend, right? Because I'm not going to achieve anything if my body is in this chronic state of stress by not having slept and recovered. So that's something I've learned as a competitor, like across the years, Jess last year would have been like, no cardio, even on three hours of sleep. But like I overslept two, three weeks ago before work one day where I didn't have time to get my cardio in. And I was like, okay, like I'm just going to, I'll do it tomorrow morning. Like, mm -hmm. I would rather get that extra sleep. Clearly my body needed it and then not stress about it and then be able to do it tomorrow. It's one day and you kind of have to have a little bit of grace with yourself. So rest and recovery people. That's where the progress is made. Amen to that. Yeah. All right. So uh, Jess, what's kind of your ultimate bodybuilding goal? I'm going to be on the Olympia stage. By when? This year or next year. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So uh, kind of the last question I have for you, and then I'll kind of give you the platform just to kind of share anything uh, in, in closing that you want. Um, what do you feel like bodybuilding has taught you or what do you feel like bodybuilding has given you? Mental toughness and discipline, both. Um, I One of my main reasons for getting into the sport, not only was to be competitive for myself, but to be able to develop and fine tune those skills and those like, the discipline to create these habits to then bring to my clients and the general public that they can apply to anything else in their lives. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm flattered when my clients come to me and they say, I think what would Jess do? Um, and my answer is always, you do the work, whatever the work looks like, like nothing else works. Um, but at the end of the day, it's you who's going to hold yourself accountable. So um, bodybuilding has taught me incredible, incredible discipline and mental toughness to push through moments that have been probably some of the hardest moments in my life um the flip side of that is this is the most elite sport you can do and um there were there's always there's always gonna be times where you're like oh, i'm so hungry like this is why am i doing this is the worst there are people in this world that don't get to choose not to eat i am choosing to not eat so i look a certain way so it's helped me keep incredible perspective on like moments where i think that i'm suffering or struggling because I'm choosing to do this. Um, and I'm creating that, that like mental toughness to understand that everything that we're doing is a choice. I'm very lucky to get to do what I do. And I hope that I can teach other people about 
having that same kind of mentality and perspective. Um, and then finally, it's brought me some really great people in my life. Like, I'm so grateful for the friends that I have um, here in New York, New Jersey, the friends that I have in D.C., um, and the friends that have, like, stuck by me that don't understand bodybuilding at all. Um, and it's it, it's been an opportunity for me to, like, inspire people that are, have been in my life already um, to do great things with their life as well. So um, I can't say enough great things about what bodybuilding has brought me. Very cool. All right, Jess. So uh, before we wrap it up here, I just want to say thank you for coming on to the podcast, uh, sharing your story, uh, giving some of your life experiences. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, before I do the outro, if you have any shout outs, if you have any final thoughts, any final words that you kind of want to share uh, with, with uh, everybody that's listening, that's tuning in, uh, the platform is yours and then I'll, uh, I'll close this out. Thank you. Well, Quentin, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I don't think there's enough opportunities for women to talk about their role in the sport. Um, and I think there's a lot of like misconceptions about um, what competing as a woman is like. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times my business is called Boss Building. So you can find it both on my Instagram, Jay Falborn, and then I have my uh, Boss Building Instagram, which is Boss, B-L-D-G. Um, so I work with a lot of clients in that way. I just started my um, YouTube channel and I'm doing a series that called the Shock Everyone series. So we just dropped our first episode last week. Um, it was our, it was a back day. And then next up is going to be, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leak what it's going to be, but it's going to come soon and everyone's going to want to see it because it's a pretty intense workout. So, um, so that's going to be kind of exciting. I'm excited to do it because it's not only going to show people like what it looks like to actually work hard in the gym as a woman. Um, but also it's documenting just my journey, which my friends and family love to be a part of. So I'm excited about that. I'm working with my friend, Chris, next level visionary is the name of his company. Um, and then I just want to, I mean, to thank people like, I mean, my home gym signature fitness, um, like they've been phenomenal with, with creating opportunities and supporting me. Um, my family has just been an, an absolutely amazing support system, which I'm so grateful for. Um, I've got some great training partners, my training partner, Mike, he's been super helpful. Um, and he's getting ready for his first show. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got, I'm very fortunate. I've got a good circle around me and then, um, I appreciate folks giving me the platform to talk more about, um, competing. So thank you Quentin, for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. What's your, uh, what's your YouTube, uh, uh, channel, Jess? Uh, it's Jess Falborn and Boss Building. Okay. Um, so if anyone goes to my Instagram, I have like the link in bio, but I've got in my link tree, I've got my YouTube linked in there. Um, but people can just search my name. They'll probably find a bunch of videos for me doing like at home workout videos during the quarantine <laughs> and then probably some of my posing stuff from stage. Um, but they'll find my, um, or if they just search like the shock everyone series, one episode is out now. Um, and, and more will come. We're going to try to do maybe like at least one a month leading up to my show. Very cool. All right. Uh, Jess, once again, thank you so much. All of you who are tuning in to another episode of Behind the Muscle Podcast, I just want to say thank you to you. If it wasn't for all of you, the podcast wouldn't exist. So I appreciate all of you. I'm grateful for all of you. Um, a couple of quick things here as we wrap up this conversation with Jess today. If you haven't done so already, make sure you go to Behind the Muscle Podcast on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's really important because I release all these episodes first on YouTube, and then I'll distribute them to the other podcast platforms, uh, including iTunes, CastBox, and some of the other popular podcast platforms. Um, and then also one other favor, please take this episode with Jess. Make sure you share it on your Instagram stories. Make sure you tag Jess. Make sure you tag Behind the Muscle. Uh, that's important. Uh, because then we know that you listened to this episode, you found great value in it. And that's just a great way that other people uh, can come across behind the muscle podcast. They're going to listen, they're going to be positively impacted. And that's really, uh, you know, the, the purpose of the podcast is you bring on athletes, you bring on coaches, they share their stories, people listen, people watch, and people's lives are positively impacted. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, share this episode on your Instagram stories. And then finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember, behind the muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.